Gallaudet University presents. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. This is one of my favorite topics, talking about deaf and hearing teams, interpreting teams. It's a fun topic as well as a really interesting one. First of all, I'd like to thank a few people before I begin. Sometimes we hold that to the end and forget about it, but I want to put that at the beginning. So first, I want to thank Mary Lightfoot. And I also want to thank GURIEC for supporting this type of workshop, a lecture. We've had some great topics thus far, and I just want to thank Mary and the GURIEC for that. Also, I want to thank the Gallaudet Interpreting Service. Um, I work there as a full-time staff interpreter, and I appreciate their support for uh, allowing me to do this type of lecture. And then I also want to thank our panelists, who you will be meeting later. And then, most importantly, I want to thank the two interpreters who are working very hard right now. Really, the worst interpreting job ever is to interpret for interpreters. So thank you very much for be being willing to do this lecture. And also, I want to share with you that I am not the expert in this field or uh, related to this topic. It's an area of interest for me that I've done a little bit of research in, but I am not the expert. I welcome any input. Please do share any information that you may have. Ask your questions. Please, please do um, engage with us, and I will go ahead and shadow your questions from here. There's no need for you, those of you in the room, to stand up and uh, come to the front to ask. Um, I can shadow that here, and then those of you online can also go ahead and send your questions. So without further ado, we will begin, and I will start by showing you the agenda for our lecture today. So I'm going to begin by talking about how I first got involved with deaf and hearing interpreting teams. I'll talk a little bit about the research that I did and how those findings impact our work. And then we will also have uh, our panelists. So um, Mary has asked me to share that information with you uh, for the first hour and then have the panelists the second hour. But I would much rather see the panelists talk more about this. Uh, so have more of the panelists and less of the lecture, and Mary has agreed to that, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, make that time adjustment. I also want to begin by defining what a deaf and hearing interpreting team consists of. I don't think this definition is very surprising. It's pretty clear. We have um, a spoken English text being channeled through a hearing interpreter. That hearing interpreter feeds or signs that to the deaf interpreter, who then reformulates that message into American Sign Language or International Sign Language. Now, my interest came when I was at the RID National Conference. Maybe you all were there, but that was uh, back 20 years ago. And um, that was the first time I ever saw a deaf and hearing team work together. It was the first time I had ever seen a deaf person on platform, and I thought that was just amazing. And so I sat close to the team. I moved myself all the way up front to watch how they were working and what they were doing, and it looked fun seemed like something that was easy and cool, and it was something I really wanted to try. A few months after that RID conference, I was asked to interpret for another conference, and there were deaf interpreters on the team. And so I thought that would be a great opportunity for me to go ahead and give it a try. And in hindsight, I'll let you know, it was not a good idea. I didn't have any practice. I didn't have any training. It was something that I just, out of the blue, decided I would give a try at a national conference. So 
um, we went ahead and gave it a try. We didn't have any prep. We hadn't ever done it, you know, worked together before. And um, so we had two teams, two deaf interpreters, two hearing interpreters. So I worked with a deaf interpreter and then my hearing team worked with another deaf interpreter. And it was very difficult. When I watched the interpreters at RID, it seemed easy. Uh, but yet, when I gave it a try, it was very challenging. And we made it through, but with a lot of work and a lot of struggle. Once it was the second team's turn to um, take the floor, they had a much harder time than our team did. And I couldn't quite understand why, because they were both very skilled interpreters. And then, of course, later I realized that um, I should have practice, gotten some training before I got up there and did that, and that it is a very challenging task. So being the feed interpreter for a deaf interpreter is very challenging and a different task than regular direct interpreting. So I went to the library to um, look for some research in the field, came here in this building, looked for uh, any literature that may be out there, and couldn't find any. So I thought that maybe um, you know, we could set up some practice sessions here. The library was equipped with two cameras um, where we could actually have a split screen with the hearing interpreter on one side and the deaf interpreter on the other. And I recruited my friends to be a part of that. You know, I think you all know who tends to stay in the basement of a library, nerds, that would be me. And my friends are not nerdy like I am, so I had to truly beg them to come be a part of this project. So I'm grateful to them, those people who got involved. So we did the video project. We talked about um, all the different videos that we made. We had a lot of discussions. We switched the teams around. We did this for a full year. Now, I'm going to show you some of those videos, but they are very old. Some of you may not even know what VHS tapes mean, but they are on VHS ta tapes. So we have many hours from that, the, that year. And it was an amazing experience. Being the feed interpreter is a very different experience than direct interpreting. And to see the deaf interpreter uh, was just amazing. It was beautiful interpreting. After that, I decided that I wanted to do a true bona fide research on the subject. So I wrote up a proposal, put it in to request funding for the research, and I will um, show you a bit about that proposal. If you just give me a minute. So my original idea was to compare a deaf interpreter's interpretation and a hearing interpreter's direct interpretation. I wanted to see if the deaf interpreter signed more in ASL than the hearing interpreter, and I wanted to see where the differences lied, whether there was similar error frequency or not. So. The next slide that I'm going to show you was my actual original research study plan proposal. I can see some questions from the audience. Um, what would happen uh, is we would have a tape recording in English. The hearing interpreter would then feed that to the deaf interpreter, who then interpreted that into the target language. At a later date, the hearing interpreter would then come back into the um, lab and interpret that same material directly. So like I said, I um, 
wrote up that proposal, gave it to the research center here at Gallaudet, and um, they, of course, had to check that with the linguistics department and check with those linguists whether this was uh, this design would work or not. And I will show you what their answer was. So my idea was rejected. Uh, it was very depressing. It had been something that I had worked on for so long, and I thought for sure it would be accepted. I didn't quite understand at the beginning why, but they had very good reason. The reason was we needed to, to back up and take a look at the feed interpreter or that subject material. Because if we went and looked at the deaf interpreter first, there may be errors in that interpretation that are not due to the deaf interpreter, but rather to the feed interpretation. So I went back to the drawing board, wrote up a new proposal, and um, I will share with you what that new proposal looks like. We'll see if uh, this works now. Okay, so moving forward, I, this was my data collection. I took a look at the hearing team who was feeding the deaf interpreter, and I compared that with a direct interpretation uh, from the hearing interpreter. So that, that proposal was approved. I got the funding and moved forward with the data collection. So we had a deaf and hearing team come to the library basement, of course. Um, they were given prep. They were allowed to um, talk about it with one another and prep together. And then they were each filmed during the session. This, uh, there was a, about a 16 minute spoken English monologue, which they interpreted from, and then were videotaped doing the interpretation. A few months after the original taping, the same hearing interpreter returned and interpreted the same monologue that they had months earlier. So we didn't have a deaf interpreter there that second time, and they did a direct interpretation of the same text. Once we were uh, done with the data collection, I hired a native deaf linguist to transcribe the uh, videos, and he transcribed everything from every facial expression, every eye gaze movement, um, yeah, every sign, etc. And he transcribed that for both the direct interpretation and the fed interpretation, and then did a comparison. And what I had thought all along was now shown to be true. 
And what we found were that there were six different elements that were common across both interpretations. So these six elements were pausing, and that was the first aspect that we took a look at. We found that there are two types of pauses. We have the pause and the pause hold. So both interpretations, both the direct interpretation and the fed interpretation, have both types of pauses, which I will um, now go ahead and talk about. Now you all know the famous interpreter pose where we stand here looking like we're praying. That is the quintessential interpreting pause. And we noted pauses in both the direct interpretation as well as the Fed interpretation. And I'll show you a brief clip to um, give you an example of what this pause looks like. So in the direct interpretation, um, we have the pause, and we will show you that. If you, anybody wants to see this repeated, I'm happy to um, show you the video again. So you can see this pause here. Does anybody want to see that again? Yes? All right, we will go ahead and show that one more time. He takes a very obvious pause where he puts his hands in front of him in that praying position and then starts his interpretation again. We noted the same pauses in the Fed interpretation, and it is a bit faster than the direct interpretation. Now, I know everybody's going to want to watch the deaf interpreter, but focus your attention on the hearing interpreter for now, who is female, and uh, maybe you're going to need to take a guess who the male interpreter is, who he happens to be in the room, um, but please focus your attention on the female hearing interpreter. as you can all see right here. Would everybody like to see that one more time? I'll go ahead and show you that. There's a clear pause in the direct interpretation as well as the Fed interpretation. Now there's another type of pausing that we noted called the pause hold. And I just want to note that linguists don't necessarily call this a pause hold. It's just a term that I came up with and I myself am not a linguist. Uh, but it's a clear term and once you see an example you'll have a better sense of what that means. 
So the sign hold or the pause hold is when an interpreter is holding the last, the final position of a sign before they begin the rest of their interpretation. And both interpretations, uh, we observed this pause hold phenomena. And um, we will go ahead and show you an example of the pause hold. As you can see here, she's holding this sign. And we actually had several pause holds in this example. One very obvious example where the interpreter held the two number two hand shape and pointed to the first index finger and held that sign until she was ready to continue with her interpretation. And I'll go ahead and show you that clip again. We also noted pause holds within the Fed interpretation. And I think that the uh, intention behind each may be different. I'll let you go ahead and take a look and make your own judgments on that. But we will uh, show you this clip now of the pause hold example within the Fed interpretation. So I'm going to show you this clip again, but let me just tell you what the examples were. The first time the interpreter said, uh, unsafe things uh, are what? And then she has her index finger up with her right hand and spells unsafe with her right hand and holds that, that those two signs. And I know some of you are over there talking about who these two people may be. Uh, they actually are siblings. Uh, and that's all I'll say, but I'll go ahead and show you this clip one more time. So take a look at these pause holds. Can everybody see these, this example of pause holds? pretty clear. So she has her index finger on her left hand and finger spells the word unsafe in the right hand and holds it longer than you would in, an, in a direct interpretation. And as I said, we noted pause holds in both the direct interpretation as well as the Fed interpretation, but they are used differently and for different reasons. And on the next graph, I will um, show you what this may look like, and the blue line represents the percentage of time held on those pause holds. So in summary, the direct interpretation, which was without any deaf interpreter, there were uh, eight pauses and 17 pauses in the Fed interpretation, whereas the speaker had 45. For the pause holds, there were 30 in the Fed interpretation and 16 in the direct interpretation. And then, of course, the speaker has natural pauses, um, but not necessarily pause holds. And the last column that's in blue shows the percentage of time spent on the holds. So for the full um, six minutes, 
for the, in the direct interpretation, about 13.4% of the time was spent on those 16 pauses, pause holds, excuse me. And in the Fed interpretation, the number is triple that of the, in the direct interpretation. So 32.1% of the time is a large percent of the time that is spent on those pause holds. And a little bit later in our discussion, we will talk about why that may be. And we also noted differences in eye gaze between the direct interpretation and the Fed interpretation. So as we looked at both the pauses as well as the pause holds, we also noticed differences in eye gaze. And we noted six different places where the eyes would gaze, up, down, right, left, as well as a gaze toward a classifier, and then a gaze toward the audience. And as I said, we didn't have a live audience, therefore the camera was considered the audience. And for the Fed interpretation, the deaf interpreter was considered the audience. So we took a look at, look at the differences between eye gaze in both the direct interpretation as well as the Fed interpretation. So in the direct interpretation, the eye gaze was downward the majority of the time. And I'm sure that you all can um, picture this. As you see interpreters standing on a platform, they don't stand with their hands in that prayer position and look around at the audience, but rather they look down. And we can see that they are clearly thinking about the interpretation as they pause. And we saw a difference with the Fed interpretation, where the interpreter no longer looked downward, but rather toward the audience, which in this case was the deaf interpreter. So during the direct interpretation, there none of the eye gazes were out toward the audience, yet the majority of the eye gazes in the Fed interpretation were toward the audience. Again, we took a look at eye gaze during the pause holds. And in the direct interpretation, again, we had the interpreter looking downward and not toward the audience. So if you can imagine uh, an interpreter standing on the platform in a pause hold looking out at the audience, that would be awkward. But we saw a difference in the Fed interpretation where they did look at the audience. So again, when the interpreter was engaged in the Fed interpretation, the interpreter was looking toward the deaf interpreter the majority of the time. <laughs> 
So when you saw the interpreter um, holding that sign, things or unsafe, the interpreter didn't look down, but rather toward the audience, the deaf interpreter. The next aspect that we looked at were head nods. Again, both the direct interpretation as well as the Fed interpretation had grammatical head nods. Um, as we all know, the head nods are a part of the language. However, we observed a different type of head nod, which we call, I called monitoring head nod. And those head nods were most often observed during the pause hold. So it was the interpreter checking in with the deaf interpreter, maybe having you know a placeholder so that once the deaf interpreter was done with their interpretation, then the hearing interpreter would know it was time to move on with their interpretation. For a, mo for a, a number of reasons, there was this monitoring head nod observed. So I already gave a um, description of what happened. So can you guess, really, if there's any difference in the number of signs that are used per minute in the direct interpretation as opposed to the Fed interpretation? And that is what we looked at in our study. The speaker was speaking at a normal pace and used uh, this number of signs per minute. And in the direct interpretation, there were 107 signs per minute used. And in the Fed interpretation, there were 83. So we need to look at the reasons for this. Hopefully, it's not because the interpreter was omitting information. And uh, of course, I had my hypothesis, and I will talk to you about that a little bit later. Um, but first, I want to talk about another aspect that we looked at, which was fingerspelling. And again, we looked at that both produced in both the direct interpretation as well as the Fed interpretation. In the direct interpretation, we observed the interpreter fingerspelling 21 times, and in the Fed interpretation, 29 times. And there doesn't seem to be much of a difference if you look at those numbers only. However, when we looked at the direct interpretation, the 21 times uh, that a fingerspelled word was used, they were mostly of the same words. Whereas in the Fed interpretation, that 29 times was mostly uh, various words and not one word being spelled more than one time. Here are just a few examples where you can see in the direct interpretation, car was spelled four times, door was spelled five times, whereas in the Fed interpretation, automatic restraint was spelled one time, others were signed one time as well. <laughs> 
And of course, you can come up with your own theory and we will talk about um, what I found. The last difference that we found between the Fed interpretation and the direct interpretation was clarification. So if there is a direct interpretation, it's a possibility that that interpreter may uh, make some clarifications with audience members, but it is unusual to do so. Oftentimes, if the interpreter's on platform and sees that somebody doesn't understand a fingerspell term or doesn't understand a concept, then they may very subtly repeat that interpretation, but without showing that that's what they're doing. Whereas in the Fed interpretation, we see much more of a negotiation and a dialogue to clarify certain terms or concepts. Here we have three examples that were noted often in the Fed interpretation. The first example is when the hearing interpreter realized incorrect information was fed to the deaf interpreter. The second example is the other way around, where the deaf interpreter initiates the clarification when the hearing interpreter has signed something that they didn't understand. And the third example is related to other various information that may be auditory, so something related to the PowerPoint or to the um, source text, whatever it may be, that communication is then conveyed to the deaf interpreter. So we have um, some clips here that I'll show you examples of. The first, again, is the uh, sibling hearing deaf team. And the hearing interpreter is struggling to understand the source text, the English source text. And the deaf interpreter is watching the hearing interpreter try to understand, and so the two are engaged in trying to understand this topic together. And the deaf interpreter clearly gets it at some point before the hearing interpreter does. And I'll show you this clip several times so that you can see that it's a joint effort to understand the source text. You can see in this example, in the beginning, the deaf interpreter does not know what's being interpreted, and then at some point, literally signs uh, that, that sign for understanding, that they comprehend, that they understand the concepts being conveyed. So the two of them work together, um, and then at some point, the deaf interpreter understands what's being signed. And you can see that he uses this uh, hand shape on his right hand in the shape of a V to indicate the seat belts, one going over the shoulder and the other going across the lap. I'm going to show you a second clip, uh, and this also is an example of clarification, and it's with the same team. The hearing interpreter fingerspells lap only. The deaf interpreter doesn't understand what was fingerspelled and asks for clarification. And then the interpreter, I mean, clearly this is a sibling team here, so the interpreter refers to you know their childhood so much. They're talking about the back seat of the car, um, and indicates that they're talking about that lap belt in the back seat of the car. So take a look at this example here. Does everybody catch that? <laughs> 
The deaf interpreter asks what she had fingerspelled. What is this called? What are you talking about, basically? And then the hearing interpreter repeats the fingerspelling and then expands on that and describes what she's talking about. That is the lap belt that's only in the back seat of a car. Is everybody clear on that example? So my question was, how could this be possible? The source message was delivered at the same speed and for the same duration for both the direct interpretation and the fed interpretation. But the direct interpretation had only pauses and pause holds 13% of the time, whereas in the fed interpretation, there was triple the amount of pauses and pause holds, as well as extra time added for clarifications. So how is that at all possible was my question. And I pose that question to you all, if anybody would like to um, share their ideas or their thoughts on that, please do. So here's one possible answer. We noted that the Fed interpretation had less signs per minute and more fingerspelled concepts. So the hearing interpreter could fingerspell concepts that the deaf interpreter could then expand upon. There were also pause holds noted after that fingerspelled term where the hearing interpreter was simply waiting for the deaf interpreter to finish their interpretation. And those pause holds were fairly long, so the hearing interpreter could check their page or not really, but it was so long that you have that sense that they could do that. And I'll show you a gloss here of one example. I know that this looks very complicated, but in actuality, the Fed interpretation here is saying that the um, interpreter signed front have automatic restraints. So they finger spelled automatic restraints. And the deaf interpreter was able to sign this in ASL. And I'll show you that clip. Um, and this is in contrast to the direct interpretation where they, the interpreter actually expanded on this notion of automatic restraints. Now, I apologize for the quality of the film. The interpreter here is in purple, so uh, that's just simply bad quality. I apologize for that. But again, that interpreter is signing, uh, basically saying that the front in the front seat they have automatic restraints. So front, have, and then finger spelled automatic restraints. And then goes into a pause hold while the eye gaze is toward the audience, that is the deaf interpreter, waiting for the deaf interpreter to finish the interpretation. 
And I will show you this clip again, but you can see very clearly the hearing interpreter signs. The front has automatic restraints, and automatic restraints is fingerspelled, and then goes into a pause hold while the deaf interpreter does the actual translation into ASL of that concept. So the hearing interpreter is using less signs, more fingerspelled terms, and therefore is able to pause and hold while the deaf interpreter does the interpretation. And I'll show you this example one more time. I think this is a pretty clear example you can see here of the um, of all of this. And the most important thing here is that the interpretation, the direct interpretation, is different than a fed interpretation. A lot of people think that it is the same task. However, it is very different. The pausing is different. The eye gaze is different. The pacing is different. The connection between the hearing person and the deaf person, the audience, is very different. And we will um, talk with our panelists to see if they agree that they are different tasks. Um, and of course, there are weaknesses in this research. Again, these films were taken a very long time ago. And I'll talk a little bit about the limitations of this study. Of course, I wish I had five deaf and hearing teams that I could have taped, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that. So the year that I talked about doing films, I did not use for my research. But after I did my research, I looked back on those and was able to see the same aspects that we noted in the actual research. The other limitation is that this is an unnatural setting. I would have loved for it to have been uh, a real uh, live setting, real time, and maybe you all can take on that research challenge. Then also the impact of the learning effect on the hearing interpreter. So the hearing interpreter had already interpreted the same source text, had already seen the, inter the deaf interpreter interpret this into ASL, and so there obviously are some learning effects um, which is another limitation of this study. And as I said, the quality of the film is um, not top notch, as you could see the purple um, for the last clip. So that is another limitation, is the equipment limitations. Now we have a question from off site. They asked if these. Uh, videotapes were f of friends. And I know that there are a few uh, projects that have um, been taking place, but none that have been published with real professional deaf and hearing teams, not since this research was done. And I think that it's probably because it's very rare that we find uh, professional deaf and hearing teams, maybe at an international conference or an RID conference or at Deaf Way or the World Deaf Cinema conference, there are very few um, instances where we see deaf and hearing teams at work. But I challenge you all to uh, use that as your PhD uh, research, because we definitely need more research. And I think I have a little bit of time. I will go ahead and introduce the panelists. And then we will take a break and ask the panelists to come to the front after or during that break, so go ahead and think about what questions you may have for the panelists or in regard to my research. And uh, this piece of the presentation is very exciting. Um, this has been a production of Gallaudet University.